everybody. It's very nice to see you here. Uh, I'm John Torciari. I'm the director of the International Policy Center and Wiser Diplomacy Center at the Ford School. And I'm happy you could join us for this, the third session in our series for this year's North American Colloquium, uh, which we're gratefully carrying out with our partners at the University of Toronto and Autonomous National University of Mexico. Uh, thanks to Azalma Valencia and Dan Ellis on our staff for organizing this and other events in the series, the first of which talked about the origins and drivers of nationalist extremism in North America in October, and the second in December, which discussed the current threat landscape. Today, we're joined by a great panel of experts to talk about the third uh, topic in our series, uh, and that is the policy tools and frameworks available for countering nationalist extremism in Canada, Mexico, and the United States. We're going to talk a little bit about how each country's laws and security institutions have evolved since the era of 9-11 to deal with new nationalist threats, and also what some of the limits of existing policy approaches are and key debates surrounding them. Our panel includes three experts in the topic representing the three countries that are part of the colloquium. Uh, first, from Mexico, Raul Guillermo Benitez Manaut is a professor at the Autonomous National University of Mexico, one of our partners, where he's worked within the Center for Research on North America since 2000. He's the author of numerous books and many scholarly articles on security and geopolitics in Latin America, particularly focused on North and Central America. And among many other roles, he's been a visiting scholar or a visiting professor at the Woodrow Wilson Center in DC, at Columbia, at the National Defense University, and American University. We also are joined by Richard Fadden, who's a senior fellow at the University of Ottawa's Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. In 2015 and 16, he served as the National Security Advisor to the Canadian Prime Minister. He previously served as Deputy Minister of National Defense and as Director of the Canadian Security and Intelligence Service. He served, among many other roles, also as Deputy Minister for Citizenship and Immigration Canada. Uh, and is extremely knowledgeable, of course, about the full range of national security uh, considerations facing Canada. Last but not least, we have Tom Wark, who's joining us uh, from the DC metro area, where he is the non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council with its Middle East programs and the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security. From 2008 to 19, uh, he was Deputy Assistant Secretary for Counterterrorism Policy at the Department for Homeland Security. He also previously served in the State Department on a variety of roles covering the Middle East and international justice issues. He's worked on national strategies involving counterterrorism and a wide range of national security issues in the Middle East, South Asia, and Africa. He also spent 17 years as an international lawyer in private practice, representing companies investing in the Middle East and elsewhere. To this uh, excellent panel, uh, we can add my colleague Javed Ali, uh, professor of practice at the Ford School, uh, who himself uh, is an expert in the topic, having served as senior director for counterterrorism at the National Security Council, at the FBI, the National Counterterrorism Center, and other roles during his two decades of government service. Javed will moderate today, uh, and let me hand it over to him uh, before we pass to our speakers for their opening comments. So thank you all for joining. Great, thanks, John, and to the team at the Wiser Diplomacy Center for putting this third iteration together. And as you mentioned, we've already covered two um, different aspects of this topic of nationalist extremism over the past couple months. But now we're going to try to move the ball a little more into the current realm and look at the policy and legal and sort of authorities landscape. And obviously we have three different views from different countries represented here. So it'd be really fascinating to, to dig into that. Um, and uh, there are a number of different sort of avenues we can explore in this conversation. We've got four more remarks from our three speakers, but then I've got some questions or themes I'd like people to, to dive into. Well, uh, we'll see how the, the presentations come out, but whether it's uh, issues about sort of the legal, uh, aspects, bureaucratic and organizational, uh, how uh, the world of intelligence uh, uh, and counterterrorism is tackling this topic. And I would think there's different approaches in different countries. And then I think a really important one too, about the role of um, the private sector and non-traditional stakeholders and, and what they are doing um, in this space. Because again, there's no one single solution set that's gonna deliver uh, 
all the results. So really look forward to the conversation. Also, I'm glad to be joined by our guests, as you mentioned. Uh, I'll just say uh, Tom and I um, go way back from our days in government service. And then even though Tom and I uh, have since left uh, the past few years, Tom and I have continued our collaboration. Tom, uh, I brought Tom out to Michigan to, to speak. Unfortunately, we couldn't make that happen uh, for this session today. Uh, and, Tom and all Tom and I also do a lot of writing on different uh, national security issues to include um, domestic terrorism and, and uh, extremism in the United States. And we just published an op-ed, what, a couple weeks ago, Tom. Uh, and then um, Richard, I don't think we had the pleasure of meeting when uh, we were both in government, but I definitely met a lot with your uh, staff at CSIS, uh, both in Washington and trips in Ottawa. So I always enjoyed my collaboration with CSIS. So look forward to, to hearing from you. Um, and I don't believe we have Raul online yet, but um, so we'll change the, the lineup a little bit. Um, obviously, uh, John Rizalma, once Raul comes in, we'll make sure to, to get him included. Um, but Richard, why don't we start with you uh, first, uh, the view from Canada and sort of the, the current kind of legal and, and policy landscape when it comes to nationalist extremism, and then we'll, we'll turn to Tom. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, glad to, to start. In starting, I just want to stress that, you know, I'm not an academic, so I'm not going to come up with a unified theory of domestic extremism and how we deal with it. So what I thought I would do is try and provide a little bit of the, the context uh, in which domestic extremism is dealt with in the decades since 9-11. And to do that, uh, I'll go back a little bit in the past, because I think that's really important to understand where Canada is. Um, so what I'd like to do is to go through maybe a half dozen of what I call meta points, meta issues, issues that affect other components of dealing with domestic terrorism. Um, and I should stress as well that uh, I'm going to generalize. I only have eight minutes or so. And, you know, if people find that I'm generalizing too much, please don't hesitate to point that out during the Q&A period. Also, in the Canadian context, and I think also in the context of the United States and Mexico, Domestic extremism is of no particular interest beyond a certain point unless there's an element of violence involved. I mean, there are a variety of constitutional limits on what you can do if people are just rambling on about things or if they're thinking. So that is also one of the underlying issues. So the first meta point I'd like to make, which I think is particular to Canada, is that Canada and Canadians do not feel particularly threatened. And I know that's an extraordinary thing to say in today's world, but I think it's true. We certainly don't feel threatened in the same way as the United States does, as some of our Five Eyes partners do. And I think that has an overarching impact on the selection of tools and how aggressive we are hey, good morning. in dealing with domestic extremism. There are a variety of reasons for this, not the least of which is our, is our location. Uh, you know, we're surrounded by three oceans in the United States. This is helpful in having us not feel threatened. I think the other reason is, is we have not had an extraordinarily large number of cases of domestic extremism. There are a list and you can find them virtually anywhere. And I'll come back to how we define these. But guiding almost every policy tool selection is this fact that we don't feel as threatened as many other countries do. And I think that is something that we must never forget. I said I'd talk a little bit about the past. I mean, Canada, aside from 9-11, where we were, I think, closely linked with the United States, has only had really one mega domestic extremism case, and that was the FLQ crisis in 1970, when you know the Federation itself was threatened. Aside from that, the cases have been fairly specific, fairly particular, and though I don't mean to diminish them because some people have been killed and died because of this, but I think it's important to remember that. In 1970, all of our policy tools were in one statute, the War Measures Act, which is one of the most sweeping grants of legislative authority that the West has ever seen. It's based on a 1914 British statute. And that sort of started us off with, you can virtually do anything anytime you want with no real parliamentary oversight. The enactment of our charter has changed this and the War Measures Act was changed in 1985 by the Emergencies Act, which allows for the declaration of, of public order emergencies, which would cover uh, extremism of the sort we're talking about. 
And then the only other statute of real importance that deals with this is the Anti-Terrorism Act, which was adopted by Parliament shortly after 9-11. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the legislative framework. Even today, we use the Emergencies Act and the Anti-Terrorism Act, plus a couple of more specialized statutes. Um, and we don't change these very much or very often. My second point would be to, to make is that no extremism is purely domestic. Uh, I think that's true everywhere, but either you have actors or inspiration or resources coming across the border. Uh, and I think this causes uh, policymakers uh, challenges because notwithstanding that the legislation applies to both domestic and international terrorism, there's a great deal more sensitivity attached to what's going on in the country. So no extremism is purely domestic. Uh, I think that's really important. Um, the other element that I'd like to add or consideration I'd like to bring out is that extremism, domestic extremism is considered to be a national security issue. Now that may seem obvious, but I can remember at the time that we were working on uh, the Anti-Terrorism Act just after 9-11, we had a real debate in Canada about whether you should just rely on the criminal law writ large and not go the route of creating anti-terrorism legislation. And in fact, one of the characteristics of, of our legislation in this area is that the substantive offensive offenses dealing with terrorism by and large are found in the criminal code. And what the Anti-Terrorism Act did in 19, uh, just after 9-11 uh, was it created special powers of investigation and inquiry, created a couple of more specialized crimes and that's basically what we've dealt, we've had to deal with uh, both domestic and international terrorism. The practical effect in Canada of viewing this issue as a national security issue is it makes it virtually exclusively a federal concern. Uh, this has the, again, practical effect of keeping the provinces, civil society and the economy somewhat at arm's length. Um, my own view is, is that that's a mistake and that national security is actually should be taken at face value. It's not federal security. And I think most federations go through this exercise of trying to decide how much the federal authorities are going to deal with thing as opposed to asking municipalities, counties, provinces and civil society. Um, in Canada, we still find it somewhat difficult to share classified information with other orders of government, which complicates life, I think, a great deal. We also find it somewhat difficult to share with the private sector, although we're getting better. It's always seemed to me that it's very difficult to ask for help from civil society or the, 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 the private sector if we're not willing to share, to some degree, classified information with them. And that remains, I think, a distinction that is very clear between Canada and the United States, Canada and the UK. I don't know enough about Mexico to say but both the United Kingdom and the United States much more open when it talks about terrorism and things of this nature. And it, it to some degree, it limits what governments can do. The other thing I wanted to mention, the other element I wanted to mention was the choice of the instrumentality of the crown, as we call it in Canada. What, what bureaucratic element are we gonna to use to deal with extremism? And I think, in part by happenstance in Canada, we've effectively chosen it to be the police and the intelligence and security agencies. I argued when I was still working that this is actually a mistake. They obviously cannot be excluded, but when you consider that people are going out of their way to avoid dealing with government if they, if they believe in extremist approaches to life, the last group of people they're likely to talk to are the police and security and intelligence agencies. And I argued, I must admit unsuccessfully, that we really should involve civil society, school boards, and a whole raft of other social institutions in dealing with uh, domestic terrorism much more than we did. Uh, at a minimum, if you view these issues of extremism on a spectrum, going from somebody has a thought to somebody blowing up somebody, if you're on the prevention side, using non law enforcement and, and intellectual or in intelligence agencies is probably going to get you further uh, than if you don't. I've talked already a little bit about the use of the general criminal law as opposed to terrorist law. So I won't do that because I want to try and stick to my few minutes that I'm allocated and I'll stop just a second. Since 9-11, we haven't changed legislation a great deal. There have been a few pieces of specific specialized legislation. 
But basically what we've tried to do is adjust to the extent possible use, through the use of discretion, uh, whether or not we want to do something. I think the other issue that all of us have is the question of definition of extremism. Uh, you know, we, we go, we're hot and cold on this. We've had a number of incidents in Canada which could easily have been categorized as simply criminal activities, which the police for one reason or the other, or the government for political reasons have called terrorism. I think we need to work on this a great deal more than we have. My last substantive point or general meta point is that we don't talk about these things in Canada. You in the United States talk about it arguably too much from our perspective. But in Canada, we rarely talk about national security. The last two federal elections, foreign defense and security policy were hardly mentioned. This makes it very difficult to develop a national consensus on what tools you can or cannot use. And as a result, when there's a crisis of one sort or the other, governments tend to respond with the tools that they have on a relatively ad hoc basis. I'm exaggerating a little bit to make my point, but if you don't have a national consensus on what, you, what terrorism is, what extremism is, it's very hard for governments to move forward and to develop new tools. So I'm gonna stop there simply to say that what I've tried to do is give you a bit of the context that, can, that Canadians have used to think about the policy options, the policy tools that they can use, the meta issues that affect virtually everything else. Last point is in this country, as I think in the case of Mexico and the United States, extremism per se is, is an interesting academic pursuit. If you don't have an element of violence, it's very difficult in Canada to do a great deal. You can monitor people a little bit, but you can't do a great deal more than that. So if that's okay, I'll stop there and I look forward to questions later on. Thanks very much. Now, Richard, thank you for that great uh, rundown of those six meta points and um, lots of really interesting insights on how Canada has tackled this over the last uh, few decades. And I think of those of us who kind of follow this issue really closely can already see kind of the similarities and distinctions with, with the US framework, um, but look forward to getting to this more in the Q&A. Um, okay, Tom, let's turn to you. And again, Tom, you've had lots of um, experience and insight on this, not only in government, but now out. So look forward to your comments. Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm actually gonna start in a couple of places where uh, Richard, I think very helpfully highlighted uh, Canada's particular approach to this. Um, and so I'm going to highlight some of the, the contrasts, uh, even though there are obviously a great many similarities in the cultural underpinnings out of Anglo-American law uh, uh, between uh, UK, uh, Canada, and the United States, uh, which come out of a roughly similar legal traditions, but have evolved in different ways politically uh, uh, in the many decades, uh, uh, you know, uh, over the last, uh, you know, two and a half centuries. Um, the, the first point I wanted to make is that for the United States, at least, uh, there are underpinnings of our approach uh, to uh, you know, domestic radicalization and nationalism that are actually relatively constant. Um, the most fundamental of, uh, of these is obviously the U.S. Constitution. Uh, and in particular, the evolution of thought uh, as embodied in Supreme Court decisions uh, is actually where I would start rather than, than looking to statutes, because constitutional decisions uh, have very strongly shaped uh, the U.S. approach towards the idea that um, freedom of speech is a constitutionally protected right. Uh, but, and this does accord with what Richard said, where it crosses the line is where it gets into violence. Uh, the Supreme Court over the past 50 years has actually changed its position. Uh, uh, at one point, government could take action if there was a clear and present danger that's about 100 years old. Uh, uh, as this changed over time, it became more permissible uh, uh, for speech to get closer and closer to the line uh, uh, under certain Supreme Court decisions, uh, many of them stemming out of protests during the Vietnam War, uh, was the idea that uh, uh, it had to be more than mere advocacy of violence. It had to be very uh, specific and particular before it would consider crossing the line. Uh, that has pretty much uh, stood the, the test of time, the approach <clears throat> of a number of Supreme Court decisions in the 1970s 
up through the 1980s uh, uh, laid out a path that many Americans had thought in the years after 9-11 uh, were relatively well understood. Uh, but that gets me up against the second theme I wanted to mention, which is uh, the political polarization going on in the United States and some of the active steps uh, uh, taken in pockets of the Trump administration um, uh, put together suggest a period of unsettled uncertainty uh, here in the United States. And uh, this is producing several competing themes to the, the relatively constant baseline trend about the direction uh, that things are going in. And so at one level, as scholars or practitioners, we can speak about the, the uh, you know, constitutional bright line between free speech and violence uh, as if this is something uh, that is, is unchanging. I mean, after all, the words of the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution are, are you know, well over 230 years old now. Uh, but uh, uh, what we're seeing is a situation in which uh, uh, the relative stability is, is contradicted by statistics showing a surprisingly high percentage of Americans, um, uh, but more Republicans than Democrats, favoring the idea that violence is acceptable uh, to achieve political change. Uh, and so uh, this is, is one of those things that makes for a very interesting academic colloquium, but actually gives a great deal of concern uh, to, to policy practitioners. What should be done uh, in this kind of environment in order to try to reduce the likelihood of people resorting to violence uh, 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 or resorting to, to, I'll call it, you know, broadly unacceptable measures uh, to try to either influence electoral outcomes uh, or, or political decision making. Uh, if we go back to the period right after 9-11, after 9-11, uh, when the threat was Al-Qaeda and, and later ISIS style terrorism, there was a brief period of a few years in which there was a fairly broad consensus that uh, the US needed broader uh, legal authorities to collect information uh, that would allow it, the United States to defeat an international terrorist threat uh, from Al Qaeda and, and groups of similar persuasion. <clears throat> this is how you had the USA Patriot Act. You had broad expansions of, <coughs> excuse me, uh, uh, the rights of the National Security Agency (NSA) uh, to collect information, including coincidentally on Americans. Uh, you had the establishment of the Department of Homeland Security. You had the purposeful refocusing of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, um, which starting in the days of Ronald Reagan had prided itself as, as being the foremost uh, organization going after organized crime, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> making the pivot after 9-11 <coughs> to being a counterterrorism organization. <coughs> excuse me. Uh, but gradually over the years, uh, through a combination of international efforts led by the Department of Defense and the U.S. intelligence community, uh, the threat of, of ISIS or Al-Qaeda-inspired terrorism uh, was, was significantly reduced, uh, and it became apparent that instead there was a surprisingly strong uh, effort by white supremacists to carry out violence inside the United States and outside of it. Uh, the links between uh, and among these various movements and groups are recognized to be very loose, very fluid. Uh, there are groups that do exist, um, but lone wolf perpetrators, uh, whether it's, it's Anders Breivik in Norway or, or individual shooters uh, in places like New Zealand or in the United States, um, uh, you know, led to an increased concern about how we should deal with and respond to uh, uh, domestic terrorism. Uh, the United States has a statutory framework <clears throat> for international terrorism. Material support to a designated foreign terrorist organization is itself a crime leading to the, to the commonly expressed and somewhat accurate view that if you so much as give a cup of coffee to an international terrorist, it makes you a terrorist as well under parts of US law uh, dealing with immigration policy. Uh, but there is no domestic terrorism statute. 
Uh, instead, you see on things like, for instance, the FBI's website, a detailed description of what domestic terrorism is. And there is, in fact, a definition of it that's broadly consistent with the definition for international terrorism. But then when you look at the U.S. criminal code, as with Canada, uh, where there was, as Richard said, an effort to, to look first to already existing criminal statutes, in the United States, the same thing generally applies. So we have a definition, but we don't have a, a separate statutory offense. Um, I've talked to members of Congress uh, uh, who say in the current political environment, it's virtually impossible to think that this is going to change for the foreseeable future. Uh, and I think certainly as long as the U.S. Senate maintains its, its present approach uh, to the filibuster under which it takes 60 senators to agree that debate should even move forward on a bill, uh, and the, the very real practical concern uh, that, that in effect the political parties significantly diverge on domestic terrorism threats, uh, prospects of this changing uh, at the moment are, are highly unlikely. I do want to uh, see if I can drop into the chat uh, a few reference documents. Actually, I think I'll do this, uh, if I may, by sharing my screen. Uh, where, hang on a second, I have to find, um, well, I'll show you what we all have here. We'll go to this. Uh, okay, so uh, in the uh, uh, early weeks of the Biden administration, coming off of a period in which the Trump administration had uh, sort of a, a, a two-tiered approach to how it treated domestic terrorism, um, at one level, there were things like the uh, National Strategy for Combating Terrorism, which Javed and I, Ali and I worked on, which had paragraphs uh, noting the existence of a domestic terrorism threat, you had things like the Department of Homeland Security had a strategic framework that it put out in October of 2019 in which it called out white supremacism as uh, a terrorist threat. Um, uh, but nevertheless, in large part because of statements made by President Trump, there were questions as to the, the seriousness which with, uh, with which uh, uh, the, the U.S. government was, was treating the threat of white supremacism. When the Biden administration came in, they issued a National Terrorism Advisory System Bulletin. Uh, this is the one from April of 2021, based on the one that was issued on January 27, 2021. Uh, and this is what really lays out the idea that uh, constitutionally protected thought is not a legitimate subject for the security institutions of the United States. Uh, to come down on it, it is uh, uh, defined by when <coughs> there is either actual violence or the imminent likelihood of violence. And so the INTAS bulletin is uh, 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 you know, a fundamental aspect of the what I call the underpinnings of how um, you have the, the distinction between uh, constitutionally protected thought and violent action. Um, in a number of places, the way the intelligence uh, community is organized under Executive Order 12333, uh, and this especially for those who, who aren't as familiar with it, really is the, the easiest to read charter of what intelligence organizations uh, in the United States are allowed to do. Uh, and you will see, for example, when you get into the sections uh, about the uh, Department of Homeland Security, uh, for example, that it is allowed to um, well, sorry, here, start with the FBI. So the FBI has the ability to run uh, confidential sources, um, but places like the Department of Homeland Security can only collect publicly available information. Uh, and so these are limitations that obviously are different from the way, for instance, the British government uh, approaches things. There is no MI5 equivalent uh, in the United States. Instead, those kinds of responsibilities are not only divided between the federal government on the one hand and state and local governments on the other, uh, they are divided differently between uh, the FBI and DHS. Um, I would commend to you uh, John Cohen, who, who is the Assistant Secretary for Counterterrorism at the Department of Homeland Security. He was also 
the acting head of the DHS Office of Intelligence and Analysis, um, uh, his hearing on uh, uh, November 3rd, 2021, uh, went through the Biden administration approach uh, to domestic terrorism, including the way it drew on the uh, uh, INTAS bulletin that John and others uh, were the primary authors of. Uh, I would commend also to your attention the testimony of Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas uh, on September. And although this was intentionally an all threats uh, uh, briefing, it does put the domestic terrorism threat uh, into perspective. Most recently, the, and this is what I'm gonna spend my last two minutes on, DHS uh, uh, released a fact sheet on all that they are doing to counter domestic violent extremism. Uh, I should say rather plainly, this was put together, uh, uh, you know, just prior to the uh, January 6th uh, anniversary of the January 6th, 2021 <coughs> attack on the U.S. Capitol. Many of you may have seen that Senator Ted Cruz got into a bit of a kerfuffle at one point calling this a domestic terrorism attack. And in that respect, if you look at the FBI website, you would see this does check all the boxes. Um, but nevertheless, he was resoundingly criticized uh, uh, by uh, commentators such as Tucker Carlson, uh, and then went on television and tried to backpedal what he said. Uh, within the Biden administration, they're highlighting the actions that they have taken. Uh, they reestablished uh, uh, a DHS Office of Intelligence and Analysis unit on domestic terrorism uh, that had been abolished early in the Trump administration. Um, they have set up improved information sharing, trying to get information <clears throat> particularly on extremist groups that uh, have either a track record or a tendency towards violence. Uh, they've issued in-task bulletins, as I've said. They have uh, expand, they, they have changed the focus of and then expanded their efforts on community grants to try to uh, uh, help local communities prevent uh, uh, domestic terrorism, uh, and they've increased funding for that. Um, uh, throughout the government, there's an effort to try to focus on uh, uh, getting people who are in the government not to uh, uh, have violent extremist views. This is something DHS is doing. It's also a major focus at DOD, where Javan and I, and I have written on this before. Uh, and it's an even stronger problem in some state and local law enforcement agencies, as our friend and colleague Mary McCord and others have written. Um, uh, and so there are a number of these efforts that are underway. The, the crucial thing in all of these uh, that we actually don't know the answer to is how much is it going to take to actually end the threat? Uh, uh, in other words, we've succeeded in changing uh, the threat from ISIS and Al Qaeda. Uh, it's now enormously diminished from what it was on September 11, 2001. What will it take to achieve that kind of a result now? Uh, and frankly, this is one of the, the issues for discussion, because I don't think the answer to that is settled. The mere fact that uh, you have a significant portion, uh, a majority of the American people recognizing that the attack on January 6, uh, 2021 in the U.S. Capitol uh, was an act of, of you know, violent extremism, uh, whereas a significant minority still thinks that this was somehow uh, the responsibility of Antifa and, and uh, uh, you know, government agents acting under false flag uh, shows you that this is very much an issue that the United States is going to be grappling with for the next several years. So, Javid, back over to you. Tom, thanks for that lay down. Also, um, I was having flashbacks to the DHS bulletins um, 20 years ago or almost 20 years ago uh, when I joined DHS. I actually wrote uh, the first few or a handful of those DHS Boltons and anyone who remembers that from back in the day with the crazy color coded system. I mean, that was, we are so far beyond what we were trying to do then. I think it's a little more nuanced and uh, informed now, but yeah, the, the whole use of, of those Boltons for, for DHS, it's, we've come a long way from when I started. Uh, but thanks for sharing that. Uh, okay, so Raul, um, we certainly have time for your remarks. Um, so thank you for joining us. So if you could please, uh, in the next 10 minutes or so, give us the view from Mexico on what the, the policy and the legal uh, 
um, landscape looks like when it comes to this issue. This issue, we know the threat is different. So curious to hear your remarks. Thank you very much for the invitation, John. Um, I'm very glad to be here with you debating the theme of the terrorism and nationalism in North America. Mexico, the problems of terrorism are very different than the, in the US of Canada. Canada. Because in Mexico, we develop a, a, a very high level, state level uh, nationalist ideology uh, within the state. This has uh, 100 years and uh, the difference, the main difference is in Mexico is a ideology. Um, the civil society in Mexico, uh, in all the political elites, there are differences, but uh, it's a, a big uh, in the last uh, 100 years. In 1938, uh, the idea that the, the, we have to close the borders and uh, move the think of the strategic uh, things for the country and who, uh, the government, the military government in Mexico expropriate the, the oil. And the, the enemy is uh, the, 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 the foreign company. Uh, are the, the oil foreign companies main from the U.S. and, uh, and we. Uh, but really, the President Cárdenas goes to support the, the, the military effort of the coalition war. And with this, it's a very pragmatic nationalism in, in relationship with the United States. Well, uh, this has uh, a, a change at the end of the, of the century with the NAFTA, with the globalization. The globalization put on on, on the more the most important change the the the, the closest economy, etc. And we don't have threats from the domestic front uh, in, in Mexico. The challenge from the left, the armed left, is, is minimal. And uh, in 1994, exploded the, the, the Zapatista rise in Mexico, but this is a, not a real terrorist tools. It's a kind of ideological movement in Mexico. Uh, and the government uh, organized a, a new speech with the negotiations with the, with the indigenous um, organization who organized the reprisal. Uh, in the last five years of the 20th century, change the uh, domestic military ideology, uh, who is a very uh, who has a very hard nationalism in Mexico, to move the idea of changing the, the ideology to share the, the security of the country with the United States and Canada, mainly with the United States, and the U.S. government try to establish the tips with Mexico in many fronts of the intelligence in the front of the, the cooperation with the military to develop capacities to face uh, different things. But uh, slow by slow, the criminal organizations start to be the terrorist challenge. And the, the Mexican government change of the, 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 the hegemony of the ruling party and moves to a, a right in uh, and uh, they uh, uh, smart border agreements uh, in, in, with the Mexicans in, in the most important tool to, to fight rights uh, in the case of Mexico, this uh, was to enforce the borders, mainly to, to have exchanges of information of, of the airports. Uh, and the US helped the Mexican government to modernize all the technological system of the migration in Mexico. And this works very well in our country. 
Uh, well, in the 10th uh, century, the criminal organizations increased their power in Mexico. The issue of terrorism and extremism inside the society with uh, is, uh, civil organizations organized in criminal. The issue is very important because have connections with the US. Uh, and they, they have branches in the US, they have branches in Canada, uh, and the, the uh, and branches with the Colombians. And this uh, is a big problem for the Mexicans because Mexico don't have the intelligence to face. Uh, cooperation with the, both warrants, the US and Mexico, start uh, with the Merida Initiative financing and development uh, since 2008. And this was the principal tool to face the organized uh, crime organizations in, in uh, the country. Well, at the society level, the, the, the democracy is the, the new speech who uh, uh, was spread in all the political elites, leftists and the center elite. Uh, also the old political party uh, has uh, a, a, a shift to, to, to support the democracy in the country. And with this, the, the, the nationalism uh, goes to uh, political elite. And many uh, people inside the political elite in Mexico share the idea the, that of uh, uh, binational security and trinational security. The NAFTA works very well in uh, many, many years, uh, uh, at least 20 years for the Mexican economy. But the main challenge in Mexico is to face the new national the presidency. And uh, Donald Trump has a very anti-Mexican speech mainly uh, against the migrants. And uh, a big debate in Mexico because they say, well, in the US government, we have an enemy, an enemy of the Mexicans in the United States. And, and this uh, causes a, a big debate in, in, in the Chamber of the Deputies in Mexico and on the Senate, the US-Mexico relations. In Mexico, also, we have a change of government, but in, in, in another direction to the left, in El Obrador, with his party. With this, we have two opposites in, in both countries. I, also, we, we have the, 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 the change of the government uh, with the Prime Minister Trudeau. And we have the three ideologies in, in North America, the, the moderate, the, 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 a kind of leftist uh, leader in Mexico, a rightist leader in the US. But the, the first and second years of Donald Trump with Mexico were very, very uh, conflictive. Then uh, Donald Trump starts negotiations with the Mexican government. Uh, of the of the trade agreement alliance with the Canadians. Well, what happened with the nationalism in Mexico? The Mexican president start a confrontation with the with the, with Donald Trump in in his uh, first months of his government in January, February, and March uh, of uh, nineteen. 20, Donald Trump starts a speech against the trade, against the Mexicans, uh, and this causes a big shake or, or, and debates in, in Mexico on what, what will be the direction of the NAFTA, what will be the direction of the, uh, the relationship with the United States and, and Canada, and what, because the criminal organization has the, the border open for them, but the, open is not, uh, the, the border is not open for the people in Mexico is uh, will be not open for the the, 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 the the trade in Mexico. And this causes a big uh, 
conflict in Mexico at the middle of 2019. Donald Trump and President López Obrador starts negotiations. And these uh, negotiations um, works well. Uh, and Mexico support the, uh, of the, 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 the control the border for the foreigners uh, and, and helps the, 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 the uh, stop of the migrants from South Africa. Trump changed the speech to Mexico and Mexico changed the speech to the United States and Canada and the negotiations uh, for the trade uh, starts again. Well, what is happening right now? Mexico don't like the, um, the pressure of the United States uh, towards the migrants. In the United States, the, migra the migrants support a lot the Mexican economy with the remittances. Mexico needs the, uh, an open border for them, uh, but has a problem with other migrants, the migrants who came from uh, South Africa. Africa, et cetera, et cetera. But the criminal organizations works a lot in violence against the government, uh, the violence between them, the violence the, against the, the, the US government to defend its, its own interests. And the violence created by, by the criminal organizations in Mexico is the terrorism in Mexico. This is our big problem. And and the extremists in Canada and the United States. When uh, my, my ideas, uh, I have to share the, this, the, this hypothesis. The current Mexican government has a, a high level of legitimacy. The President Lopez Obrador has a lot of support of the Mexican population. And his, uh, his speech a lot on negotiations, not directly with the organized crime organizations. Indirectly, he, he more violence, et cetera, et cetera. This, this speech is not like for many, many Mexicans who want justice. And also in the United States uh, government don't like this kind of speech of, of the Mexican government uh, and, and has promised to, to deal with the criminal organizations because with the, uh, with the pandemia, with the, the Mexican uh, conditions are the same so far than before. The, the criminal organizations, there are no, they are no, uh, is more or less the same before the pandemic and the uh, the last uh, two years. Because of, the, of, of this, the Mexican government don't have a strategy to face the criminal organizations. The United States government tried to help uh, uh, and to change the assistance to the Mexican government to, to have an uh, for the Mexican security. But this is the problem, Mexico tried to don't uh, hear the US speech against, against Mexicans between the supremacists in the United States, etc. But it's very, it's very difficult to, to, to work with this. For example, to end, Mexico has many problems with the, uh, the, the, go the governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, because he has a very, very aggressive speech against Mexico, against the Mexicans. He wants to build a, a, a wall in the border, et cetera, et cetera. And these kind of issues don't help to have a common strategy uh, between the, the, the two countries against terrorism, criminal terrorism. And uh, the idea inside to support a new nationalism against the United States, current Mexican world, uh, uh, different approaches to the United States. One, you know, on the one hand, uh, the government came from the left. The government don't like the US imperialism. And on the other hand, some uh, very important uh, 
uh, officials in Mexico uh, uh, has the idea that negotiate with the United States we need to, to confront the organized crime organizations. Thank you very much, uh, John. Thank you very much, Mukafa, Thomas, and Richard. All right, Raul, thank you for that really uh, comprehensive view on the, uh, the landscape in Mexico, both on the threat side, but also um, on the, the policy and the legal side, as you, as you noted, you're facing a very different environment than the, certainly the one here in the United States, but even um, when compared to, to Canada. But that does raise a host of interesting questions. Uh, John, I think we've got about 10 minutes left, right? If my uh, clock is correct in terms of uh, the session, but we have at least one question in the chat. And for those of you who are still online, I would ask you to, to put your questions um, in, uh, in the chat too. Uh, so let me turn to the question from Drew Fagan uh, and I'll just um, read it. Uh, uh, out loud, and I'm just seeing um, we actually have uh, hopefully about 20 minutes, so not as tight of an end, but again, we've got time for Q&A, so please would welcome additional questions. So Drew, um, your question is, uh, as I had discussed, and you know, everyone provided their uh, individual perspective on you know, sort of state of play in Mexico, Canada, the United States, but your question is about what about efforts at coordination and mutual engagement? Is there the potential for some kind of continental security in your words um, on this uh, topic. Uh, and you drew in your question, you raised um, the, the notion of the Proud Boys who interestingly, as Richard, know, Richard knows, Canada has designated as a terrorist organization under Canadian law, but we have not in the United States because we don't have a list of domestic terrorist organizations. So uh, I throw that out to our, our uh, panelists in terms of this issue about, um, kind of tri-party coordination and mutual engagement um, on this topic of nationalist extremism. If so, what would that look like? Uh, uh, I'll start, and I'm interested in, in Richard's and Raul's thoughts as well. <clears throat> um, it, it's, it's probably necessary, uh, Drew and Javed, to, to disaggregate uh, the kinds of groups that we're talking about. Um, the uh, 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 you know some of the sort of white supremacist groups uh, that exist in the United States have uh, analogs or offshoots in Canada, uh, not quite so much in Mexico. Um, but uh, uh, Richard mentioned uh, the the you know frustration uh, that I think many American law enforcement officials feel towards uh, law enforcement cooperation with Canada. Uh, that cooperation tends to be very good in specific uh, criminal cases uh, where there is a, uh, a strong investigative predicate for why U.S. law enforcement would be asking yeah. about, you know, where was a particular individual on a day if they're trying to nail down a, a factual case. Um, but Canada uh, tends to have very strict standards that limit its sharing of information uh, uh, you know, tell us who's been sending suspicious texts and emails. Uh, uh, and so something like that, uh, uh, the cooperation is something that uh, uh, folks in law enforcement in the United States uh, sort of gnash their teeth about how difficult it is uh, uh, to get cooperation with uh, uh, Canadian counterparts. Uh, that said, in the United States, people can be difficult as well when the sharing is sought in the other direction. Um, but uh, most of the feeling, I think, is is uh, towards recognizing right. the greater strictures that Canadian authorities have on sharing of information in a number of, of ways. Right. Um, with Mexico, uh, uh, cooperation has been, you know, particularly up and down. Uh, much of it tends to focus on counter narcotics uh, coming north and on arms guns, weapons, and other kinds of explosives going to the south. Uh, so violent extremism is not the, uh, uh, the security challenge uh, that drugs and guns are. And so that's what tends to get most of the attention from law enforcement uh, uh, between U.S. and Mexican authorities. All right, Tom, thanks for that. May I jump in? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, I, I agree with Thomas's point that sometimes we can be difficult. Um, uh, 
Having said that, uh, I think there are a couple of points. Is there a real prospect of trilateral active cooperation? I think that would be an uphill battle. Uh, I think in part because of the, diff di the differences between the situation in Mexico and, and in Canada. Um, but I also think we need to distinguish a little bit what we're talking about. I mean, I, I found when I was working anyway, that Canadian officials never ever declined to share information with the United States on active threats. I mean, if I'd ever heard of one of my officials refusing to do that, I would have fired them. So I think we need to distinguish on the one hand, relatively active threats with ongoing long-term RCMP or FBI investigations, which sometimes it seems to me can go on to, for decades. And then the sharing of strategic information uh, or intelligence, which I think is pretty good, probably could be better. But uh, we do share some information. We do share some activity with Mexico, but the differences in approaches seem to be so significant that there's not a great deal of it. Uh, I mean, I can remember when I was still working, one of the big challenges in terms of sharing with the United States was the Patriot Act. You know, we'd share something with the CIA and the next thing we knew it, uh, you know, somebody in the state of Michigan who was, you know, admitting somebody into the United States said no because they misunderstood the information which we shared with the CIA, which the Patriot Act required them to share. I'm generalizing to make a point but one of the issues that we find very hard to deal with is it's very difficult to share, excepting at discrete criminal, act, criminal investigations, it's very difficult to share with the United States Agency X as opposed to sharing it with the United States government. And that does create problems for us because of one of the requirements of Canadian law that you don't share information unless there's a specific locus of interest. And I think if we dealt with that, it would be easier. In any event, I want to come back to my disaggregation point, which I think Thomas also mentioned. Threat information, criminal law investigation, and general strategic sharing, I think goes on at various levels. I think they can go on without heads of government or heads of state being involved. I do think, on the other hand, that as I, one of the points I made, there is no such thing as something that's purely domestic. It just ain't there. And we do find it easier to share if there's an international component. So, you know, we've declared Proud Boys to be a, a, a terrorist organization. There are other organizations that I think could, could make their way onto that list. Easier to share once that happens, because from our perspective, uh, there is an international link, the United States. So I think I'll stop there, but worth working on. Richard, thank you for that. Raul, anything on this notion of, uh tri-party coordination and cooperation when it comes to nationalist extremism from the view of Mexico? Yeah, uh, well, right now in Mexico, the intelligence institutions are controlled by the military. Uh, and this, this is good, in, 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 on the one hand, this is good because the, the military has all the information uh, collected by, uh, on the criminal organizations. But on the other hand, this is not very good because the military don't like, for example, the, the relationship with the United States when they focus some to what was the case of the, uh, of the Secretary of Defense in Mexico two years ago and create a big, big conflict with the Mexican uh, between the Mexican federal government and the, the U.S. federal government, uh, because the action of the DA uh, and the 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 way that the U.S. agencies works in uh, work in Mexico is a big problem for us. And and other thing is the the questions of, of the question of the arms, the traffic of of weapons, etc., through the border, because the Mexican government uh, said that the the, the U.S law uh, and the, the amendment uh, is against Mexico and the US government don't have uh, tools to control the way that they are selling arms. And the Mexican government all the time in the, in the last 10 years are talking about uh, the US government don't, don't do nothing to help us to stop the traffic of weapons. And they 
uh, put so, so, some uh, demands in, in some courts in the United States, in, in Massachusetts right now, et cetera. And this is a, a big uh, issue uh, where the, the two governments don't have a, a share idea uh, to, have, to, to work together to face the, 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 the same problems. Uh, in this case, the military in Mexico has the idea that the, the Mexican national security problems um, are, uh, are in, the, in the hands of the Mexicans and the US government is uh, only works for its own interests. In some cases help and in, in some cases are against, uh, against us. The, this is the, the general idea, but the common idea in Mexico, civil society, journalists, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is the idea of the, the border. The, the idea that the, the, the white supremacism is against the whole Mexico and in some states like Texas, uh, Texas because Texas because it's in the border or Arizona, etc., don't like the Mexicans and all the people uh, talking about uh, why in the US don't stop this kind of speech. Obviously in the US, the, the political system is very different than the Mexican. Uh, but this is the, the, the key issues. And the, the question of the, the freedom of, of speech, uh, Jordan uh, put a comment in, in, in the chat. Uh, in Mexico, the, the, the question of the freedom of speech, the role of the journalism, et cetera, is very different than, than in the US. The Mexican president uh, many times in the last months uh, talks against the journalism in Mexico. And if a journalist uh, against the criminal organizations is working and mention corruption inside the government, the, these uh, people are against the government in, in the idea of the government, uh, of, of the president. And this is a big problem because it causes a big difference between the, the, the political leadership and the civil society in Mexico. May I make a small point? Absolutely. Um, just going back to the, the initial questions, it seems to me that one of the things that we haven't mentioned, laws and culture are important, but so are relationships. And I, and I found when I was working at any rate, that to the extent that you had officials working in the same area for a while, you could do a great deal in terms of sharing and coordination without violating anybody's laws. And you know, one of the challenges we have, and this is not a criticism of the United States, you're a superpower, you're huge, Sometimes just finding the right agency to talk to uh, is as significant as the substance that we want to talk about. I mean, just to give you an old joke, when Tom Ridge initially came to Canada after 9-11, he brought a delegation of 45 or 50 people. <laughs> and in the end, we were thanked for giving them the opportunity to meet each other. So again, it's not a criticism, it's just reality. But you can understand that from our perspective, that is actually a real problem. Uh, finding, you know, who's the lead, who are the ancillary organizations, and then developing ongoing relationships. I think relationships in this area are important in intelligence sharing and security, because you have to have a measure of trust that's somewhat greater than, for example, you're talking about, uh, you know, the sharing of information about homelessness. Anyway, I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. Tom, did you want to jump in on that? Or did you want to... Um... Uh, address uh, Jordan's question in the chat as well. Um, well, no, I, I mean, I, I think uh, uh, one of the more significant challenges uh, that I think we're going to see in the next few years uh, uh, is going to be determined if the United States uh, proceeds on a, a path that is divergent uh, from the path that the Biden administration has chosen. Um, uh, I really do think that there would be Canadian reluctance uh, to share certain kinds of information that previously would be considered uncontroversial uh, if the United States adopts positions that are wildly at variant with current norms, not just in the United States, but with Canada as well. Um, uh, you know, and I mean, it, we're facing similar things, by the way, in the areas of, of arms and, and counter narcotics efforts. Uh, with Mexico that just happens not to be in the domestic violent extremism area. Uh, and th this, I think, highlights the, the importance within the United States of trying to, to you know, uh, keep law enforcement and other national security institutions as nonpartisan as possible. 
uh, uh, this has been a, a, a conscious approach of the Biden administration, just like it was a conscious approach of the Bush administration or other administrations of either party that I could name going back uh, throughout my professional life in Washington. Um, uh, but I do think that there's, there's uh, you know, going to be and should be significant concern that this kind of approach uh, needs to become even more institutionalized. Uh, lest we lose the kind of cooperation that we have, have come to take for granted with our uh, Canadian and in other areas, our Mexican neighbors. Um, uh, Javed, you and I both worked uh, uh, in different capacities on trying to <clears throat> ensure that the United States could prosecute uh, several terrorists uh, uh, who were at one point British citizens uh, for the murder of Americans in northern Syria uh, during ISIS's control there. Uh, and we saw how, how the U.S. approach, not just on the death penalty, but in other areas, made it significantly harder for Britain uh, to cooperate. Uh, that was one, you know, well-publicized, very visible case. Uh, but as Richard indicated, and as I indicated in my remarks, a lot of the cooperation between the United States and Canada, just like cooperation between Mexico and the United States, exists at the working level and is considered routine. Uh, uh, and, and if the United States strays too far from the professionalism and approach that have, I think, benefited all three countries in their mutual security efforts, uh, then there is the risk that, that we could lose the benefits of the partnerships that have been built up uh, uh, with great effort over many years with our Canadian and our Mexican neighbors. That would be a loss to U.S. security. It would be a loss to the security of the North American continent. Uh, and so I think that's something that ought to uh, ought to give pause as we look at the long term course of uh, of our own national security institutions here in the United States. And I'll just kind of reinforce those points that both you and Richard and Raul made the the importance of these personal relationships and being the glue that sometimes binds organizations together. Uh, you can't underestimate that, and it takes so much time and effort to build those relationships and to build the trust because um, it just doesn't happen automatically. And once people rotate out or go into different roles, then it's it's hard to, to kind of start anew again. Um, but really good conversation. I want to thank everyone for your time. Um, John, I know we're getting close to the end and uh, at least for the students here at Michigan, there's probably several who've got to run to their next class. So why don't I, John, turn the, the mic back over to you and maybe you can bring us home with some closing remarks and then a view for the next session as well. Thank you. Uh, and that was a great conversation. I learned a lot and I uh, hope all of you did. Let me just say very quickly, uh, in addition to the thanks, how well I think this leaves off for our fourth session, which is going to occur on, I believe, February 11. We'll advertise that broadly. Uh, that will be about new approaches to thinking about countering nationalist extremism. One thing that was interesting to me that was common to all three of the, the, the countries, even though they differ in many ways in their relationship with nationalist extremism, is the importance of how the, the challenges and threats are framed and described and conceptualized. And in all three countries, uh, our, our expert speakers mentioned ways in which the framing and the exposition of the threat has led certain, certain tools certain institutions, uh, uh, certain laws to, to be applied to nationalist extremism. Those are not necessary choices. For example, it doesn't have to be uh, approached as terrorism, it doesn't have to be approached as a national security threat. One of the speakers from our second session in December, uh, Cynthia Miller Idris had a few pizzas out this week, advocating a reframing of nationalist extremism as something more akin to a public health threat uh, than a national security threat. And I think that in our fourth session, we can explore further, what are some creative ways to consider revising or reforming the existing set of tools and frameworks that we have uh, to be able to meet these challenges as effectively as possible. And so very indebted to our three speakers today for a really engaging and, and informative discussion of the tools and frameworks available uh, and for setting us on a great course uh, to wrap up our series next month with a discussion of some, some new approaches. And so thank you all for coming very much. We hope to see you again at our next session uh, and have a great afternoon.